rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Dearest respected viewers, and welcome to Live in London on this auspicious and joyous occasion of the birth of Imam Sadiq alayhi salam. Imam Hussain TV would like to extend its congratulations to you at home and also to the Imam of our time. Who was Imam Sadiq? A lot of people would be busy commemorating the Prophet's birthday. And do we neglect this Imam? This Imam had a great impact on the religion of Islam, but how? How did he affect the religion spiritually? How did he affect the religion academically? Why are we known as the Jafari school of thought? These questions and much more will be discussed with Dr. Sayyid Amar Nakshwani. Dr. Salaamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullah. Wa Alaikum as salam wa Rahmatullah. How are you this evening? Alhamdulillah, very well. As I mentioned before in the introduction, in regards to a lot of people will be commemorating the Prophet's birthday. What about, do you feel that the community neglects Imam Sadiq alayhi salam on this uh, occasion? Because they do share the same birthday. Well, it's an honor for us to be gathered remembering Imam Sadiq alayhi salam. And the sadness of all sadnesses in the world today is that there are many who have never heard of Imam Sadiq alayhi salam. There are many who have never been raised with the name of Imam Sadiq or the heritage or the legacy of Imam Sadiq alayhi salam. But you're right, in the week of 17th of Rabi al Awwal, I find that many Muslim communities will say that today is the wilad of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, and his family. And even on the advertisings in some of our Husseiniyas or some of our Imam Bargas, you'll find that the people will mention, for example, the birth of the Prophet, and everybody will say, Mubarak on the birth of the Prophet, mm -hmm. but hardly there's a mention of Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam. In many cases, I think this is something very innocent. I think there are many people who would love to honor Imam al-Sadiq every day of the year. Well, naturally, all of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt would always stress on the greatness of the one who set the example for every human being, and that is the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and his family. Well, I also believe at the same time, if on the night of the birth of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, his family, maybe we can have programs on the day of the birth mm -hmm. looking at Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam and the reason we've done two nights is because we believe that for many years Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam hardly gets a look in hardly gets True. a mention on the 17th of Rabi al-Awwal not that I think Imam al-Sadiq would be too unhappy if Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa yes. gets all the plaudits mm -hmm. um, you know the first of us is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi you know yeah. the middle one of us is Muhammad the last of us is Muhammad, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. and they're all honored to have the mention of the Prophet Muhammad in every aspect of their life. But alhamdulillah, I hope we set uh, uh, what I hope is, uh, is a principle for many communities now that two nights, one for the Holy Prophet, one for Imam al-Sadiq in order that we're able to learn from the many lessons that there are from their lives. Yeah. For the viewers at home, if you have any questions that you would like to direct to the doctor, Please call us on 0203-515-0199 or alternatively there will be a WhatsApp number provided on the screen and you could send in your questions there and we'll do our best to get through all of them. Doctor, a more personal question in regards to our community. Um, Imam al-Sadiq is known as being one of the most knowledgeable. Um, do you feel that we haven't given justice to that knowledge? Do you feel that maybe we have lacked a little in academia as a community, as a Shia community? Are we not... Do you think Imam al-Sadiq would be proud of us and our academic and our learning in today's modern society? I believe that we have so many sincere individuals in our communities. But sincerity is part of the whole equation. Mm -hmm. It's an important part. But there has to also be that active reading, the active writing, the active seeking of knowledge. Imam himself, alayhi salam, on many occasions would give you a classification of his followers and the different types of followers that he has. There are many who wanted to be associated with him. We are the Shia of Ja'far al-Sadiq. Mm -hmm. We are the Shia of Ahl al-Bayt salam And the Imam himself would mention that there's one type, there's a second, there's a third. If you were to divide the Shia into three groups, he said there are those with knowledge, there are those who are seeking to gain knowledge, and the rest is really a waste of time. Oh, wow. And so I think it's very important for us to realize that in our lives, it's fundamental that we continue the legacy of his grandfather, the Prophet, peace be upon his family. 
When the first of the verses revealed to him was the word Iqra, read. The second surah of the Holy Quran to be revealed to the Holy Prophet was called Qalam, pen. Wow. So already in the first two surahs which are revealed in the Holy Quran, you've got a focus on reading mm. and a focus on writing. writing. There are many who claim to be Ja'fari or Ja'fariya in their madhab. Yet if you were to ask them how many books have they read recently yeah. in relation to the lives of the Ahlul Bayt there mm -hmm. are some who will go a whole year without having read one book. Wow. We're not asking you to, for example, read the Holy Quran. Say you don't have time, you find it difficult. Okay, at least these days with the technology that you have, try your hardest to be of those who Imam Salaam says, either you're the people of knowledge or you're the people seeking knowledge. Yes. Not those who are an absolute waste of time. Excellent. And it's sad today how many you find in the world who are wasting their time when there is so much literature out there. Let me quote another hadith of Imam Sadiq related to this. Imam Sadiq says, السلام, an orphan is not one without a mother or father. An orphan is one without literature. Ascent. Our definition of orphan normally, what is it? Someone, Someone who's lost a parent exactly, yes. or lost both. Mm -hmm. Imam Sadiq السلام, wanted to turn this definition on its head. By saying, if you want to know the orphans of our community, it's those without literature. Those who can't quote you the Quran, those who can't quote you the discussions and the sermons and the narrations of the Ahlul Bayt. And so the Imam himself would continuously seek to stress on the fact that no two days are the same for any Shia. You know, I vividly remember how he would make clear to his own companions that, you know, for a Shia, I know two days are the same in the sense that if yesterday I read one eye of the Quran, mm -hmm. tomorrow I'll read two. Yesterday I picked up and thought of and reflected on one tradition. Tomorrow I'll reflect on two. Mm -hmm. Ascent. If we are exactly the same two days consecutively, then we've not made that criteria of the signs of the mu'min in the eyes of Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam. Today, when you have all these Amazon and Kindle and PDFs nice. and you're able to download PhDs and able to download journal articles from very established journal pages and websites, there really is no excuse for someone to say that they are not knowledgeable. All of us have a resident alim in our community. That resident alim is someone you can go and sit with five minutes, ten minutes, nice. ask them to recommend for you a book. On history, a book on ethics, a book on theology, a book on law, a book on spirituality. Do you think that someone who says there's not enough English literature, is that an excuse? There's a lot of English literature out there. I'm surprised mm -hmm. when someone says there, you know, there's not a lot. However, to give them benefit of the doubt, I must agree with them that many don't have the guidance as to which books to read. For example, mm -hmm. on my Facebook you'll find that we begun last year Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq book club. Ascent. And every month, I try to recommend a book in the English language for people around the world to be able to read and mm -hmm. to be able to benefit from. Ascent. And I purposely named it Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq book club because we know very well the most narrations that we have in the school of Ahl al-Bayt is from Imam al-Sadiq and the greatest of students within his school, outside of his school, mm. emerge in his classes. So there on the Facebook, we're trying on a daily basis or a monthly basis to recommend books which people are able to benefit from. But to say that there isn't enough English works out there, there are. Mm -hmm. There are many English works. If you look at the website, for example, alislam.org, yeah, yes, al-islam.org, yeah. yeah. phenomenal website. It's library. Many who have volunteered and endeavored tirelessly to make sure that people have got the best of works readily available for them. But it's up to us to take time out from ourselves. Otherwise, what do we Muslims become in reality? Like the donkey that carries luggage. Yes. The Quran and on a day like this, on a Friday, mm -hmm. many of us go to the mosque. We hear that the examples of those nations who came before us who carried the holy book it's like a donkey that carries luggage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're carrying it, but you don't read it. Mm. Don't study it. Many 
الفولورز بهذا البيت عم نهجر البلاغه ات هوم اي جارنتي يو ذات ان لاست يير ماني اوف ذم هاف نوت سبنت 20 مينتس ريدنج اني سيرمون ماني هاف رساله الحقوق الصحيفه السجاديه يو نو اذر وركس ماني علماء هاف ليفت تريجرز اوف نوليدج سو ا ترو جعفري از ايذر ا بيرسون اوف نوليدج اور ا بيرسون هو سيكن تو جين مور نوليدج ان الكافي او شيخ الكليني You have the narrations from the imams which talk about the merit of those people who, for example, if they memorize 40 traditions, they are raised as one of the scholars in the That's hereafter. That's 40. That. Is it that difficult for a person to go out there and memorize 40? I don't think so. Not in a lifetime, no. no. I don't think so. The ability is there for a person to be able to go out and memorize 40 traditions. Naturally, shaitan is going to stop you. Shaitan is going to whisper to you, don't go out and read, go enjoy yourself. But make a balance in your life. Ascent. Enjoy, no problem. But have that balance where you're continuously gaining knowledge. Ascent. Yeah. Being known as the Jafri school of thought, uh, or, um, why have we been blessed with such a name? I thought we were the Shia of Ali. Why don't we be called you know, the school of Ali? Well, I think such a title is given is really given to us, you know, uh, one may argue posthumously. It's, I don't think it's given to us in the time of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, alayhim salam. Yes, Imam Sadiq himself mentions the fact that the behavior of his Shia mm -hmm. has a bearing on his name. Okay. There is this idea of the adab of Jafar al-Sadiq. There isn't necessarily the idea that there is a madhab called the Ja'fari madhab. One may mm -hmm. argue in the Safawid period, that's when this emerges, this title okay. of the Ja'fari school of thought or the Ja'fari school of law. Some will mention it in contrast, for example, to the other madhahib, as Mahmoud Shaltut, the uh, scholar of Al-Azhar, had mentioned mm -hmm. when he talks of the five schools of law. Yes. But certainly in relation to the fact of how the Shia relate to Ja'far or Ja'far bin Muhammad, you have narrations where the Imam talks of the fact that our, our etiquettes, our morals, our behaviors with those around us of other schools, our school or different school has a bearing on the name Ja'far, on the followers of Ja'far, on the impression of Ja'far. The famous lines where he talks of the fact that if there is another school in Islam, say they have a janazah, mm -hmm. Salat al-Mayyid. People ask, can I go to the Salat al-Mayyid of other schools in Islam? Of course you mm -hmm. can. Can I pray behind other schools in Islam? Yes, you can. And it all goes back to the fact that when the people see you doing this, they will say, truly Ja'far al-Sadiq has given the best adab to his Shia. Ascent. So in terms of title, When we're looking at title and someone wants to say, for example, these people are Ja'fariya, that comes much later. But in terms of relation to Imam al-Sadiq and our behavior, that can be seen very early. Ah, yeah. In regards to Imam Ja'far Sadiq, we know him as to be one of the greatest teachers. So how did he actually create a learning center there in Medina? How big was this learning center? How many students did he have? Well, you're looking at... Uh, at a period of upheaval. Mm -hmm. He's around 50 years of age, or definitely in his late 40s when the Umayyads fall. Mm -hmm. And when that Umayyad empire falls, you find the Imam in the aftermath of the fall of the Umayyads and the rise of the Abbasids. It's at this period where there's relatively more freedom for him. Okay. Any revolution, one government overtakes another. In that small period of transition, there's a bit more leeway okay. for you to be able to discuss for the first time in over a hundred years the teachings, the merits, the laws, the ethics, the theology of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, and the religion of Islam. Sorry. Because if you look at the first 
four imams, let's say. Yes. They're living in a period where they can't openly express due to different political circumstances. With Imam al-Baqir, there's a bit more of that expression. Mm. A bit more leniency. And then Imam al-Sadiq, it flourishes. That's right. And I'll give you an example of how that has an effect on the situation of the Shia at the time. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, died in the 40th year after Hijrah. Mm -hmm. For 92 years, nobody knew where he was buried. Wow. Because he was buried secretly in the middle of the night. Okay. The Khawarij had wanted to burn his oh, body. Oh, so he asked Imam al Hassan and Imam al Hussein to bury him secretly in the night, mm -hmm. like his wife was buried secretly yes. in the night. 92 years, nobody knew where Imam, Imam Amir al Mu'minin was buried. Some of the Ahlul Bayt would go to his grave with very close companions of theirs, mm -hmm. but without revealing to anybody else, just that close companion. So Imam Zain al-Abidin, for example, would take Abu Hamza al-Thumali, mm -hmm. and they'd go near the grave of oh, Imam Ali, mm -hmm. stand there. Abu Hamza, for example, at that moment would not know this is the grave of Imam mm -hmm. Ali alayhi salam. And then Imam Zain al-Abidin would tell him this is the grave. Mm -hmm. The first person to openly declare where Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, was buried was Imam al-Sadiq. Now, that gives you a hint uh, of the year 132 after Hijrah. Uh, Imam al-Sadiq is about 50 odd at the time. Uh, Abbasids have just overthrown the Umayyads a couple years earlier. Uh -huh. And even where Imam Ali's grave now can be known before, wow. hither to that point, you would not know where Imam Ali ibn Talib mm -hmm. al grave was. But now Imam al-Sadiq, in that few years, there's a transition period. In Medina, therefore, it's no surprise when we read over three and a half thousand students. Wow, three and a half thousand? Yes. Three and a half to four thousand students would sit in the class of Imam al-Sadiq So this is at one time you're saying? Well... Some will say over a period of time, that's the maximum okay. numbers that okay. were recorded. Mm -hmm. Some of these are the biggest names you'll ever find. Wow. When you hear the names of Abu Hanifa, for example, okay. and Nu'man bin Thabit, you find that there are many, for example, today in Pakistan who follow the Hanafi school. Yes. In India, there are many who follow the Hanafi school. You find, for example, Malik bin Anas, mm -hmm. the Maliki school. Who would have thought Many in North Africa follow the Maliki school. There are others who study under Imam al-Sadiq huge personalities. There are others who are contemporaries of Imam al-Sadiq But the way they describe him, there's a spirituality which is unique, knowledge which is unique. And when Abu Hanifa says in his famous lines, if it wasn't for my two years mm -hmm. with Imam al-Sadiq, I would have been perished. Just two years. Two years. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you, if you gave me a chance to sit five minutes with Imam al-Sadiq, <laughs> that would be the biggest honor for me. Inshallah, inshallah one day. Inshallah, we receive the intercession of the Ahlul Bayt, all of us and the uh -huh. viewers, inshallah. inshallah. So what you have with Imam al-Sadiq is that that period where the Abbasids overthrow the Umayyads mm -hmm. allows that school to flourish. Awesome. You have people from far and wide flocking to come and study under him. Okay. Because they know that nobody in his time was as learned as Imam al Sadiq. Yeah. Awesome. And with um, such a personality and such an influence on uh, people uh, coming to study with him and having being, you know, the greatest of teachers, mm. I mean, is that still honored today? Is, is his influence still felt today? For example, are the universities named after him? Are there certain people who have, you know, written biographies or have accredited and acknowledged his input and impact on the academic society of the Middle East? Sadly, there really is a campaign, be it from the end of the life of Imam al-Sadiq until today, of people who have purposely tried to ensure that credit is not given where credit is due in the case of Imam al-Sadiq They're willing to discuss Abu Hanifa but won't discuss who taught him. They're willing wow. to discuss Malik bin Anas and they won't discuss who taught him. They're willing to discuss the period of knowledge 
But they won't discuss the greatest theologian, the greatest man in the world of ethics, world of spirituality, the greatest mind when it came to the Quran and the world of Hadith. Sadly, even some of the most famous narrators of Hadith who have you know, huge works which are revered until today. The likes of Muhammad bin Ismail al-Bukhari, for example. Mm -hmm. Or Muslim bin Hajjaj in Nisapuri. They have the famous works Sahih Bukhari mm -hmm. and Sahih Muslim. Muslim. They have quotes from certain people, but they won't quote from Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam. You wonder why? Some try to say, well, he's a jurist and that's why they don't. Well, there's a few jurists they quote from without hesitating. <laughs> and I wonder what is it that stopped them from quoting from the likes of Imam Sadiq alayhi salam. How is it that we have so many quotes, so many traditions from Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, but Sahih al-Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, which were written at least 50 odd years after Imam Sadiq passed away, okay. will not quote anything from Imam Sadiq. That, of course, does not stop certain great books written about mm -hmm. Imam Sadiq alayhi salam. But if you are asking me in the Muslim world today, if I go to Egypt or I go to Sudan, if I go to Medina where he's buried, or if I were to go to, for example, Pakistan, will I find universities which are happily named after Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam? I've seen universities which are named after students of Imam al-Sadiq. Okay. I've seen students... I've seen students of the students of Imam Sadiq have named after uh, universities named after them. But then part of that, we have a responsibility. Why don't we, for example, fund a chair mm -hmm. at a university? Same way there are chairs which are named after Iqbal or Nehru or JFK or Gandhi or Luther King. We should have a chair at a prestigious British or American university. Named after Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam. I look for example, the Saudi prince Walid bin Talal. Mm -hmm. He's funded chairs which are named after himself at prestigious universities in America and in the UK. Mm -hmm. So when someone asks me, has history honored Imam al-Sadiq the way he deserves to be honored? I'd say no. If someone asks me, should we blame others on this issue only? Again, I'd say no. We are also responsible for ensuring that we don't cocoon Imam al-Sadiq to ourselves. It's fundamental that the world learns about Imam al-Sadiq One of my favorite works in the English language on Imam al-Sadiq is called Imam al-Sadiq, the great Muslim scientist and philosopher. Wow. You wouldn't normally associate, when you think of the Imams, you mm. think theology, you think ethics, you think law. Yes. You think spirituality maybe, yes. you know, in terms of the traditions. But you don't normally think of science and discussions mm -hmm. of, you know, the world of biology and chemistry and physics yeah. and geometry and astronomy. And yet this work, which is available on the Internet, Imam al the great Muslim scientist philosopher, seems to be a group of scholars who have come together in France oh, wow. at a certain period and written about Imam al and how he discusses theories you know, postulated by the greatest of minds in Europe, um, greatest of philosophers, greatest of scientists, and how he's discussed them a thousand years before they've even, wow. you know, given service to humanity. This highlights to us that Imam al-Sadiq is not just a personality for the Shia or for the Muslims. Every human being in this world should be one who benefits from the principles and the knowledge of Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam. Yeah. Hassan, doctor. We're talking a lot about his academic background and we're talking about his impact on education and, and universities. But he is an imam of the time, no? And is it our fault that we haven't touched on his spirituality side as a community and that we don't know uh, much about how he spiritually improved us and our community uh, like the Shia? Did? Well, I must admit that my understanding of Imam Sadiq growing up was a very legal Imam al-Sadiq. Mm -hmm. Imam al-Sadiq, Madhab al-Ja'fari, okay. Fiqhi school. Awesome. So my <laughs> understanding of Imam al-Sadiq when I was growing up was looking at a lot of the traditions or even in our studies, we look at a lot of the traditions of Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam 
related to tahara, najasa, talaq, you know, uh, let's say for example areas such as salah, psalm, hajj. You know, whenever people would mention Imam al-Sadiq, I'd, I'd always remember, you know, traditions on salah, traditions on hajj, look through my fingers, you'll see mm. the real hujjad. <laughs> A lot of legal traditions I would find. And I think it's sad if we narrow Imam al-Sadiq to simply being a person of law simply because there's a madhab called al-Ja'fari oh, named yeah. after him. Mm -hmm. Imam al-Sadiq in spirituality, some of my favorite supplications are from Imam al-Sadiq Supplication for the zawar of Imam al-Husayn mm -hmm. from Imam al-Sadiq. Mm -hmm. اغفر لي ولإخواني وزوار قبر أبي عبد الله الحسين عليه السلام الذين أنفقوا أموالهم وأشخصوا أبدانهم رغبة في برنا ورجاء لما عندك في وصلتنا وسرورا أدخلوه على نبيك صلى الله عليه وآله Oh Allah forgive me my brethren and the visitors of the shrine of Hussein عليه السلام This tradition is from Muawiyah son of Wahab صحيح tradition wonderful chain narrated a number of works Forgive me, forgive my brethren and the Zawar of Hussein alayhi salam. Wow. Those who spend their wealth to go and see him, put their lives in danger for him. Because of their relationship with us and because they want to put a smile on the face of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. So then he says, Tarham tilka al khudud allati taqallabat ala dhariq abi abdullah. Oh Allah, have mercy on those cheeks that rub themselves on the grave of Abu Abdullah. And then he continues to say, and have mercy on those eyes that shed tear for us. And have mercy on that heart that burns for us. Have mercy on that person who wails and screams when they remember our masaib. Mm -hmm. Oh Allah, these zawar, I leave them with you on the day of judgment. That you are the one who quenches their thirst from the pool of Kotha. That supplication for the zawar of Imam al-Husayn alayhi salam is a very underrated supplication. Sadly, there are mm -hmm. many who don't know this supplication. Mm -hmm. Dua for Zawar al Hussein alayhi salam. Many do not know that this is a supplication from the wonderful lips of Imam al Sadiq alayhi salam. Also, you want to see the spirituality of Imam al Sadiq alayhi salam. The dua, the supplication we recite after Salat al Isha on Rizq. Mm -hmm. Allahumma innahu laysa li ilma bi mawda'i rizqi wa inna ma atlubuhu bi khatarat takhtaru ala qalbi. فأجول في طلبه البلدان فأنا في ما أنا طالب كالحيران لا أدرى في سهل هو أم في جبل أم في أرض أم في سماء أم في بر أم في بحر وعلى يدي من ومن قبل من وقد علمت أن علمه عندك وأسبابه بيدك and so on supplications from Imam Sadiq عليه السلام many people in the world today when they recite the dua the supplication after salah do not know this supplication comes from Imam Sadiq عليه السلام these supplications have been left behind for us because truly, what defines the greatness of the Imams of Adelbayt, in contrast to all around them, and Shiism in particular, our supplications cannot be compared. There is no school in Islam that has supplications on how to talk to Allah like the supplications we have within the school of Adelbayt. Do you agree? A hundred percent. So what would you say about our supplications? I would say about our supplications, I think they're very, very intricate, very, very sensitive. And they, they manage to use the right words and create the right mood and emotion in order to create and strengthen the relation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Look at Sayyid Muhsin, you can see in the period of Hajj. Look in the period of Hajj. Mm -hmm. You can sit next to a tent from any other school in Islam. All of them are hujjaj, but you listen yes. to the dua, Oh Allah, forgive me. Oh Allah, forgive my brothers and sisters in... Bosnia, Chechnya, Palestine. Oh Allah, yes. forgive my parents. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasna fi lakhir hasna. Okay, good. That's it. It's good. You've supplicated to Allah. You've taken the odd dua from the Quran. It's good. But can you have a supplication like dua Araf of Imam Hussein? And that's why you'll find some out there who'll say, but we love Ahlul Bayt as well, brother. You don't need <laughs> to teach us about Ahlul Bayt. We love Ahlul Bayt. Okay. Tell me dua Araf of Imam Hussein. Have you yes. read it? You claim to love Ahlul Bayt. It's not about just love. Mm -hmm. There are many Muslims out there when you mention Ahlul Bayt, they're like, yeah, but brother, you see, we, you don't understand. We don't have a problem with Ahlul Bayt. We love Ahlul Bayt. Which dua of Ahlul Bayt have you ever recited? Which legacy of the supplication of Ahlul Bayt have you ever read in your mosques? Exactly. 
when it comes to books of certain hadith narrators, you memorize them inside out. And they're nothing to do with Ahlul Bayt. But when it comes to the legacy of Imam Al-Hussein, Imam Zayn al-Abdin, Imam al-Sadiq, where's your love of Ahlul Bayt there when it comes to their supplications? So Imam al-Sadiq, I agree with you, Sayyid Muhsin, we've limited him as Imam al-Sadiq, the Imam of Fiqh and yeah. Sharia, and forgotten that Imam al-Sadiq, when it comes to supplication and spirituality, you'd be hard-pressed to find people who have the whispered prayers and that relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala like Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam. Ascent. In regards to Imam al-Sadiq teaching, I mean, was there not much opposition and vice versa? Imam al-Sadiq, there was, like you said, the Umayyad dynasty was falling down, the Abbasids were taking over, he didn't want to start his own revolution or something, he focused just on educating the Muslim Ummah. I think the policy of the Imams alayhi salam at this stage was a policy where there's no more rising against the governments or being too politically active or close with the governments. I think that's the policy they decide has to be adopted. One may argue they believe that until the rise of the Mahdi. And while their cousins from the descendants of Imam al-Hasan alayhi salam were certainly causing a lot of damage to the Abbasids. Mm -hmm. See, the Abbasids gained power with a slogan that authority belongs to Ahl al-Bayt yes. but they were meaning themselves, not <laughs> the Imams. And people felt let down, people felt betrayed. And certainly the grandsons of Imam al-Hasan alayhi salam, your nafs al zakiyas amongst others, you know, people who were rising against the Abbasids. But the Imam himself doesn't call for any rise or any mutiny against the Abbasids. At the beginning, because of the upheaval of the revolution, he's able to disseminate knowledge with a lot more ease. But that doesn't stop the Abbasids from keeping an eye on his activities. You know, Al-Mansur al-Dawaniqi, you know, in Baghdad, one of the most expensive areas in Baghdad is an area by the name of Al-Mansur. And that is named after the man who poisoned Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam. Many Iraqis, mind you, will not know anything about this when it comes mm -hmm. to Al-Mansur. Say, so Al-Mansur is in Baghdad. You say, okay, Mansur is named after who? Mm -hmm. Who's Al-Mansur? Why is this expensive area named after a killer of Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam? And you find that Al-Mansur becomes the caliph who begins to harass the Imam more than anybody else. You know, to the extent that Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam, before he passes away, Al-Mansur wants his governor to keep an eye on the will of Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam. At the beginning of the life of Imam al-Sadiq, there's a lot more freedom at the beginning of his Imam. No. Whereas towards the end of his Imam, even his will, he doesn't put the name of Imam al-Kadhim as the only person. Uh, yeah. In the famous story where five mm -hmm. names are there. Yes, yes. Because the Mansur orders that whoever's the successor is to be executed. Yes. And the Imam puts a, a number of names. So the Abbasids were certainly keeping a close eye. By the time with their political uh, revolution was taking place and stabilizing their government, he had that bit more freedom than the rest of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt. Oh, so uh, so you now we're going to have to go for a break. Sure. So. Viewers, please join us after the break as we'll be continuing the discussion on the life of Imam Jafar Sadiq alayhi salam. Join us after the break and if you'd like to call in, call us on 0203-515-0199 or alternatively you can send your question via WhatsApp and inshallah we'll read them out and answer them for you. See you after the break. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Welcome back to Live in London, where we'll be we are discussing Imam Jafar Sadiq on his birthday, and inshallah, all of you are celebrating 
and a congratulations from us on behalf of Imam Hussain TV, extended to your family and also the Imam of our time. If you'd like to call in on uh, the, this, uh, and have a question in regards to this discussion, please call us on 0203 515 0199 or alternatively you can WhatsApp us and we will do our best to answer your question. With me is Dr. Amar Nakshwani. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as salam. Doctor, we were discussing um, Imam Sadiq and his spirituality and hadiths. You also said that he narrates the most hadith. Most of the hadith we have in the Shia school of thought originate from Imam Sadiq. What about the hadith of the other Imams? What happened to them and how come he kind of said all of the hadith? Well, I, th I think as I said, uh, there's a, f a couple of reasons that one may look at why he has uh, the most narrations. I think if you're looking in terms of the first uh, four Imams of Ahlul Bayt, there wasn't really that writing... Uh, culture that was either encouraged or in some cases prohibited in the early period after the death of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family. If you ask many of our Sunni brothers and sisters, what's the earliest book of hadith that they have in their houses, for example, mm -hmm. or that they see in a library in any of their famous seminaries, you won't find uh, 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 you know, a book of uh, traditions until maybe early second century. Um, and if you're looking uh, at the likes of Sahih al-Bukhari and Sahih Muslim, you're looking at late second century. Mm -hmm. So the idea that early Islam, you had a lot of books compiled or that written tradition was ahead of oral tradition. I think you'll find that the, the caliphs after the Prophet, peace be upon him and his family dies, not only do none of them have any books, but they don't seem to be encouraging the publishing of books. If anything, okay. Umar bin Abdul Aziz, the Umayyad Caliph, is the first one who we really see an encouragement mm -hmm. of works to be published. Now, when it comes to, for example, looking at the later Imams of Ahlul Bayt, if one wants to say, for example, why does Imam al-Sadiq have more hadiths than Imam al-Jawad or Imam al-Askari? Imam al-Jawad and Imam al-Askari, if you add their life on the earth, they lived between them less than Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam. Oh wow. They, if you add their uh, years on the earth, you're just about in your early 50s. Wow. And Imam al-Sadiq died in his late 60s. The oldest Imam of Ahl al-Bayt alayhi salam to pass away was who? Was Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam. Alayhi salam. Born in the year 80, died in the year 148. Mm -hmm. 68 years of age Imam al-Sadiq died. Imam al-Jawad and Imam al-Askari, between them, you add both of their ages, mm -hmm. you're going into the early 50s. Wow. So Imam al-Sadiq not only lives at a time where writing is already encouraged, publications are now becoming a plenty, but you've also got the fact that the Abbasids overthrowing the Umayyads allows for more freedom in narrations. And you've also got the fact that he lives longer than any of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam. I do believe we have a caller on the line, sure. so I'd like to invite them on. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Your name and where you're calling from? He lives longer than any of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt alayhi <laughs> salam. We're a bit, bit behind. Assalamu well, alaikum. That was a nice question. <laughs> okay, unfortunately, unfortunately the caller, um, they have technical difficulties and the caller couldn't remain on. Um, please try call again and get through to us and inshallah you can ask your question and the Sayyid will answer it inshallah. I don't think we've had a show where we haven't had technical difficulties. <laughs> inshallah. So, uh, inshallah. It's, it's not know, my fault. <laughs> no, the, the, the backroom team hopefully, you know, this time in the year 2040 would have sorted it out. Inshallah. inshallah. We were talking about hadith and you were saying at this time, Imam, the time of Imam Jafar Sadiq alayhi salam, writing was encouraged. For the viewers, um, considering it is both the, the birthday of the Prophet and also Imam Sadiq is there any literature you actually recommend to them uh, you know, to help them gain a bit more knowledge in the lives of these two individuals? Well, in terms of the life of Imam Sadiq and the Prophet, peace be upon his family, yeah, separate, separate Imam Sadiq the greatest work I have ever seen on the life of Imam Sadiq is Musnad al-Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam by the late Sayyid Muhammad Kazim al-Qazwini. Okay. It's a phenomenal, phenomenal work. 57 volumes and counting. 
57 volumes. 57 volumes. Wow, and that's Musnad al Imam And you want to see traditions on every single area wow. of the life of Imam al Sadiq alayhi salam is phenomenal. Said Muhammad Kadhim al Qazwini, the late said Muhammad Kadhim al Qazwini, phenomenal research. And really, it highlights to you the impact and the legacy of Imam al Sadiq alayhi salam. One also has to remember the great scholar that is Muhammad Jawad Mughniya, the Lebanese scholar. And his work looking at the school of law of Imam al Sadiq in comparison to the other schools. One also has to look at the grand scholar that is Ayatollah al Rawhani mm -hmm. and his work, the fiqh of Imam al Sadiq. So these are three which I would highly recommend for anyone who wants to study in depth the life of Imam al Sadiq. Now we're going to give the caller another go. We're going to try, inshallah, get this question to come through. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Your name and where you're calling from? Yes, wa alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Your name? My name is Zafra. Yes, my name is Zafra. I just had a quick question for the Sayyid. I just want to know, have we got a chain of narration like we have for Hadith? Do we have a chain of narration for the Quran as well? Because we're always told that the Shias don't have a chain of narration for the uh, Quran. Uh, that we use Sunni or something. Thank you very much, brother. Inshallah, they say we'll answer your question. And, and sorry, sorry, brother. Uh, just one second. Yeah, I just wanted to say to the uh, Sayyid that I bless him because you know what? He's changed me over the last few years. I've changed a lot, and uh, a lot of it is due to obviously, obviously, uh, a lot of it is due to listening to that uh, brother's lecture. So Allah bless him, man. Thank you very much, Sayyid. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, brother. God bless you, and thank you for your kind call. Of course, our understanding of the Holy Quran comes to us from the Ahlul Bayt alayhim as okay. and from not only their narrations, but the narrations of their companions. You look at when people study, for example, today, the recitals and the readings and the understanding of uh, the readings of the Quran, and they bring up the names of Hafs and Asim and Warsh and so on. You find that all of these are students of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt alayhim yeah. salam or peers and contemporaries of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam and many of them would have got guidance from the Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam. So those who today are telling us and giving us these names of people in relation to the recital of uh, the Quran and the discussion concerning, for example, compilation and collection. Much of our knowledge will come from the Imams and the disciples of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt And this is not disagreed upon by even our Sunni brethren. Our Sunni brethren will refer to these personalities, mention the qara of the Quran by these personalities, but very few will know that these are disciples or students of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt Ahsan Sayyid, Ahsan. I do believe we have another caller on the line. Inshallah, we'll be able to get through to them. Assalamu alaikum, your name and where you're calling from? Wa alaikum as salam, Sayyid Martin. Uh, Assalamu alaikum to you and a very learned salam. personality, Dr. Mark Akshwani. This wow, is Aslam Hashim from London. Okay, uh, local just, boy. I, I just saw uh, they uh, started watching the program. So maybe he may have already um, uh, de described the uh, definition of Pisa Jafri. Why okay. do we call Pisa Jafri? Is it not Pisa of Muhammad Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Ascent, ascent. Um, doctor has actually discussed this beforehand, uh, but for your benefit, I'm sure he'll be able to give us a short uh, answer again. And uh, that's quite good, actually, like, as in people of the other schools of thought will come up and say, why are you, um, you know, uh, calling yourself Jafri Fiqh? Why are you not relating it to Rasulullah Wasallam, who is the person that unites us all and who actually initiated this Fiqh uh, in the first place? As I mentioned earlier in the program, and I'll repeat, inshallah, there are a few ways in which we understand the answer to this question. First and foremost, the idea of the Ja'fari school of fiqh is not something which is necessarily seen in the lives of the Imams as such a title. Rather, it's seen in the Safawid period, where there is this mention of al-fiqh al-Ja'fari. Secondly, polemically, it would be mentioned because there is al-fiqh al-Hanafi, 
الفقه المالكي الفقه الشافعي الفقه yes, الحنبلي yes, so in polemics people would refer to the contemporary mm-hmm. of those people or even their teacher in the case of two out of four of them thirdly whatever imam al-sadiq alayhi salam says as the words of imam al-baqir yeah. the words of imam zain al-abidin the words of imam al-hussein yeah. the words of imam hassan words of imam ali yeah. from rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam so if we believe that we are known as the ja'fari madhhab then we recognize that whatever our imam has said is the exact words and the purest way to get to his grandfather the holy prophet peace be upon him and his family Hassan, Hassan. Hassan. I think you're quite popular tonight because we've got another call on the line. Sure. Inshallah, we'll be able to answer this question as well. Assalamu alaikum, your name and where you're calling from? Assalamu alaikum, it's Dania Jawad from Hull. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Um, my question is We say that Abu Hanifa was a student of Imam Ja'far al Sadiq. If that's the case, why didn't Abu Hanifa follow the Ja'far school but instead establish his own? Thank you very much for your question. Quite a good question, actually. Sure. I don't think any of them really established their own schools. Mm-hmm. These are all uh, people of knowledge, um, people of learning, uh, and they attend different classes, and they come to their own conclusions. But certainly Abu Hanifa is told very clearly by Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam that if you're going to reach your conclusions on the basis of conjecture mm-hmm. and give an opinion in my presence, then you've not understood where the knowledge of Imam comes from and where your knowledge comes from. In the study of Mantaq, we make a clear distinction between ilm which is hudhuri and ilm which is husuli. Yes. Ilm which is hudhuri is that knowledge which is direct, immediate. Mm-hmm. Ilm which is husuli is that knowledge which is acquired. Abu Hanifa acquires his knowledge from attending the classes of different teachers. Imam al-Sadiq acquires knowledge either through ilham, inspiration, direct, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the heart of the imam. Or from kasb, from the imam Mm al-Baqir, acquiring from imam al Abidin, from imam al-Hussein, from imam al-Hassan, from imam Amir al-Rameen, from Rasulullah. From Jibrail, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes. So when a person comes and says, Abu Hanifa, these schools, the Hanafi, Maliki, Shafi, Hanbali schools, were not actually established by those who they are named after. Mm-hmm. And they certainly weren't codified as the four main schools of Islam until, uh, one may argue, a hundred odd years after mm-hmm. some of the main protagonists even pass away. You mm-hmm. know, so... A person who imagines that the Hanafi school was present and codified by the government in the time of Abu Hanifa, not at all. Abu Hanifa, on the contrary, had problems with the government of his time. Yes, one may argue that a couple of hundred years after Abu Hanifa lives, because there's so many different schools Mm of uh, law, they narrow them down to four. Mm -hmm. We're confident when we say that we are Ja'fariya. Because we know that our school is the one that purely goes back to Rasulullah. Rasulullah through Imam al Baqir, and I doubt anyone Muslim of any school can say there's anyone more knowledgeable than Imam al Baqir in his time. Yes. Through Imam al Abidin, I doubt anyone can tell me there's anyone more knowledgeable than Imam al Abidin when Imam al Abidin is living. Through Imam al Hussein, no one's more knowledgeable than Imam al Hussein when he's living. Through Imam al Hassan, no one's more knowledgeable than Imam al Hassan when he's living. Through Imam Ali, I defy any Muslim to show me someone more learned than Imam Ali when Imam Ali is alive. Back to Rasulullah. Oh, until today. Back to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Abu Hanifa school is a fiqh school. Mm-hmm. Imam al-Sadiq should never be narrowed down to a legal mm-hmm. school. Ascent. He's our imam in fiqh, our imam mm-hmm. in theology, Spirituality. our imam in spirituality. Spirituality. Abu Hanifa may be an imam for many in fiqh, yes. but they don't take their theology from, from Abu Hanifa. Yeah. Might take their theology from Abu Hassan al-Ash'ari, for example, mm-hmm. or from Maturidi, or from Tahawi. But they won't take their theology from Abu... From who? Abu Hanifa. Mm-hmm. My theology, my understanding of Tawheed, Nubuwa, Qiyam, is from who? Imam al-Sadiq. My understanding of spirituality is from Imam al-Sadiq. Mm-hmm. My understanding of law is from Imam al-Sadiq. I sent, I sent Sayyid. I do believe I have another caller on the sure, line. Inshallah, I'll be able to get through. Assalamu alaikum. Your name and where you're calling from? Hello. Hello, Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Can you hear me? Okay, loud and clear. Your name and where you're calling from? 
Yes, uh, my name is Alitra Qureshi and I'm calling from London. Can I talk to Sayyidi? <laughs> You're more than welcome to. Fire away your question. Hello? Yes, go ahead, go ahead. Um, yes, Sayyid. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I want to thank you. You're spreading the most valuable knowledge there is in the world. And um, I've been following you for years now. And um, because of you, I'm going to uh, the ziyarah of Imam Hussain al-Salam on the 17th of December. MashaAllah. Oh, God bless Mashallah. you. Remember us in your da'a. Yes. And I, I dream of going uh, to the ziyarah um, with you as well one day. So my question is that... Um, can you tell us, uh, tell us about some books that our youth can uh, read about the Imams? Um, because it's very important for us to uh, connect uh, to Imam, our Imams directly, right? So that was my question. Thank you very Thank much you so for your much. question. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Yes, well, I have to plug in the 14 Infallibles, you know, my book on, <laughs> on the Imams. I think it's... Uh, you know, hopefully for the youth, it would be a beneficial Inshallah, work. you'll give away signed copies, Inshallah. Inshallah, inshallah <laughs> why not? Or you could just go to Amazon and order it. Uh, I think as well, uh, the great scholar of Najaf, Sharif Baqir Al-Qarashi. Mm -hmm. Phenomenal biographies of the lives of the Ahl al-Bayt, yes. Big collection. And they're translated in the English language, yes, each yeah. one of them. From the biography of the Prophet, peace be upon his family, all the way till the biography mm -hmm. of Imam al-Mahdi, Hajj al Allah Faraj al sharif um, Those are, you know, two... Uh, two recommendations but definitely his biographies uh, are definitely worth reading because they give you a real understanding of the lives of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt also Shaykh Al-Mufid's work Kitab Al-Irshad mm -hmm. um, is a great classical text for a person to get an understanding of the lives of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt yeah. Ascent, Ascent. Doctor we've been discussing um, Imam, uh, Imam Sadiq السلام, we've been discussing the different schools of law can we move our conversation towards the different theological debates that he had um, and how he tackled uh, and refuted their arguments? Well, I think one thing what's, what's amazing about him is his open-mindedness and his tolerance of different opinions. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I find that in our communities today, if we hear somebody is, for example, an atheist, we're, you know, we're straight away on the bandwagon, let's kick them out, let's not talk to them, let's not get close to them, let's not discuss anything with them. Or someone's a polytheist, you're always wary of are they najis, are they not najis, what's mm -hmm. the purity laws. And, and yet, in his time, you have atheists, you have polytheists, you have people who may be quite antagonistic towards the, you know, the Shia school. Mm -hmm. But he is extremely calm in his discussion. Maybe something that people like myself and others are, should learn from and try to adapt within our own discussions, really. Because none of us are perfect, and no better examples than the Ahl al-Bayt, as to how to look at opinions. You know, he'd always mention, هذا رأي أهل المدينة, هذا رأي أهل الكوفة. This is the opinion of the people of Medina. This is the mm. opinion of the people of Kufa. You know, open discussion. Atheists would sit with him. One would come to him and say, show me God. You know, and some of us might feel, well, antagonized if someone mm. comes to our mosques and says, show me God, you guys all believe in this God, where is God? Mm. And he'll tell the person, look at the sun. The person would look at the sun, remove his eyes, and the imam said, what's wrong? He said, oh, the rays of light were you yeah. know, hurting me. And the imam said, if you can't bear to see the creation, how do you expect to see, see the, the creator? creator? He didn't kick this atheist out of the gathering. He didn't turn around and say, well, if someone doesn't believe in God, then they should be excommunicated from society. At the end of the day, someone who doesn't believe in God, they may have their reasons. Some, for example, scientifically, they base their whole worldview on science. Mm -hmm. And they say that, listen, this is, the scientific conclusions are not giving me the certainty that there is a God out there. Some may believe that there is something out there. Some may say there is a first cause, but they don't want to call it God. Mm -hmm. But we should be looking at the tolerance of Imam Sadiq. Secondly, look at Imam Sadiq. He sees that there are other theological groups at the time. There are those who believe in complete predestination. Mm -hmm. There are those who believe in complete free will. There are those who believe God has a body. There are those who believe God can never be seen and has no body. There are those who believe that he is a scholar but not someone who is a ma'soom. Mm -hmm. 
There are those who, for example, revere the Abbasids and have no respect for him. But with each one of them, he speaks to them at the level of their intellect, and that is the sign of wisdom. Yes, when you speak to a person on the level of their intellect, mm -hmm. and you appreciate that they may have a different worldview to yours. Um, you know, you'd find sometimes people would say to him, if our Sunni brothers, for example, have got, let's say, if at the time those who are different to the Shia have got a Janazah prayer, do we join it? Like, join it. Pray behind, pray behind them. Many occasions he'll always praise those of his community who try and revive the affairs of Ahl al-Bayt mm -hmm. And when they ask him, how do we revive their affairs? He says, gain from our knowledge and give it to the people. You know, so there was a lot of theological debates happening at his time. But the beauty of his discussions, you know, with atheists, with even members of his own community who want to explain to, who want to ask him, explain to us creation. There's this discussion he has with Mufaddal, the son of Omar, where he talks about how God creates everything. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a wonderful, I think there's a book called Tawheed al-Mufaddal. Yes. Where people, you know, in discussions about the reliability of the conversation <laughs> and dialogue. But however, it's a wonderful yeah. discussion about how creation happens you know the necessity of the first cause mm -hmm. reflecting on the creations of allah and recognizing uh, the beauty of that creation awesome. so what i find most fascinating is that in that period where there are many theological debates and discussions there isn't a single person in history who looks at imam al-sadiq in a negative manner mm -hmm. it's always the man was a man of such calmness such awesome. morality such mm -hmm. ethics such beauty and that is what we need to apply in our discussions as well. MashaAllah, MashaAllah. Let's take the discussion towards his more his personal life. Uh, we know about his father, Imam Bakr, السلام, but who was Imam Sadiq's mother? And also his wife, Imam Sadiq's wife. And what kind of relationship did they have? And, and how did she aid him in, in his mission and his campaign? Yes, his wife has a major role in his life. Uh, her name is Hamida. And he becomes the first of the Imams of Ahl al-Bayt to marry from North Africa. Mm -hmm. This actually sets a trend where all the Imams who live after him marry from Africa. Um, and he marries this lady, Hamid al barbariya She's from the Berbers, Berbers of North yes. Africa. Uh, and it seems they have the most amazing relationship. He, he praises her in the most unique way. You know, normally that type of praise is reserved for for example, another of the Imams of Ahl al Bayt, mm -hmm. or you know, one of the highest companions, but she, she occupies praise where he says, you know, she is Hamida in this world, Mahmuda in the hereafter. If you want to seek knowledge, go to Hamida's door; she'll give you knowledge. Um, she, of course, later on is the one who picks the wife of Imam al Kadhim alayhi salam, mother of Imam al Rada by the name of Najma uh, or Tuktam. So, this lady, I think, really sets an example in terms of those. Sisters of ours who may be watching the show tonight, who may be thinking, can I one day become an alima? Can mm -hmm. I become a mujtahida? Can I become a dhakira of Ahl al-Bayt, a mulyani? Uh, can I become someone who gives majalis a mullah in, on behalf of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam? The likes of Hamida al barbariya the likes of Asma bint Umais, the likes of Sayyida Zainab, the likes of Umm al-Banin, the likes of Sayyida Fadda, the likes of Sayyida Fatima al masuma uh, You know, they give you wonderful examples of how knowledge is able to impact the lives of those around them. Mm -hmm. You know, Hamida is welcoming the woman of Medina um, on a regular basis. Any of you who have any questions, and sometimes in our communities, our women in our communities, if they have questions, it may be difficult for them to open up with these questions to the male scholars of the community. Yes, yes. And we need, and we, alhamdulillah, year upon year, you see more and more women in our communities getting the microphone, providing us with wonderful lectures, learning, you know, lectures where we can learn so much from them. And we need many more who can follow the example of that Hamid al Barbari, -bar -bar inshallah. Inshallah. We're coming towards the end of our, our show, but I think this is a very important topic that we must discuss. Is the sons of Imam Sadiq alayhi salam and also a split within the inheritance of the imamship. Um, we know about uh, Imam Musa al-Qadim, but 
the Ismaili sect, or maybe they prefer to be called the Bora sect, they have a different opinion and a different history, you could say. Would you like to discuss that? Well, within the, the Shia sect, you have the Zaydi Shia, who of yes. course go up to uh, Zayd, the son of Imam Zayn Abdi and brother of Imam al Baqir, so the uncle of Imam al Sadiq. Then you have this difference between the Ithna Ashari and the Ismailiya. Ismailiya take Imam Sadiq's eldest son, Ismail, as being mm-hmm. the Imam uh, who is the successor to Imam al Sadiq. Whereas the Ithna Ashari take his third son, uh, Musa ibn Jafar. As being the successor of Imam al Sadiq. You mentioned the Buhra. Yes. Of course, the Ismailis are divided into two. You've got the, mm. the ones who follow today the Agha Khan, the Nizaris, and you have the Buhra, um, who have a huge community one finds in India, for example. Yes. So, in the eyes of the Ifna Ashariya, Ismail dies before Imam al Sadiq. And therefore okay. cannot be his successor. Mm-hmm. Some turn around and say, well, that means his son uh, could be the successor. One goes into occultation mm-hmm. and so on. And the chain continues until today. There's a split seemingly at the 21st of the successors of uh, Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam. That's where you have the Nazaris and the Buhra going into their own different versions of authority. Whereas we believe that no, Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam had made clear that Imam al-Kazim is his successor. So these are differences which mm-hmm. can be discussed amongst the scholars, inshallah. Ahsan. And also, more to do with um, the burial of Imam Sadiq, alayhi salam. Where is he buried? I mean, can we expect to find a nice, huge monument, a big dome where he's buried? Well, sadly, you know, the state of his grave is... You know, I think path. kings in Saudi Arabia have better <laughs> graves than the grandson of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family. Imam al Hassan, Imam Zain al Abidin, Imam al Baqir, and Imam al Sadiq are all buried in Medina, in Jannat al Baqir. Yes. And their graves were demolished by the Saudi royal family in 1925. Mm-hmm. Um, Saudi royal family felt that if you build a, or erect an edifice with a dome on top of someone's grave, then you're leading to polytheism. Um, hither to that point, virtually every school in Islam had this as a practice for their different saints. And those who left a great legacy until they demolished all of this in 1925. Doesn't stop us honoring Imam al Sadiq. They've tried to demolish the grave of Imam al Hussein. And there are 20 odd million who visit Imam al Hussein over a few days. Yes. They try and demolish the grave of Imam al Askari, Imam al Hadi in Samarra, and still people flock there. And they continue to try and you know, demolish graves. That is the, you know, the, the low level of the you know, morals of these people. Doesn't really surprise me when I saw ISIS demolishing the grave of Prophet Jonah. Yes. Prophet Yunus. Who's the prophet for the Jews, for the Christians, for the Muslims? This is what you expect of the barbarity which Saudi Arabia spreads. Of course, we can't talk about Saudi Arabia <laughs> because, you know, they have important oil alliances with certain uh, famous Governments. countries. Mm-hmm. And therefore, one has to uh, stay quiet. Um, otherwise, you know. You have certain people who will not be too happy. But when it comes to Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam, inshallah, there will be a day inshallah. where we'll erect an edifice like it was before on the grave of Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam. And if it doesn't happen in our lifetime, we will ensure that we'll keep on spreading his legacy and his knowledge. Definitely. I feel sorry for those who have never heard of Imam al-Sadiq. And I feel sorry for those who have had Imam al-Sadiq hidden from them in the books of history where they mention his students and not mention him but you can't burn out the light of Allah on this earth until today wherever you travel in the world you'll hear that there are sons who are called Ja'far and if they're not named after Ja'far al-Tayyar then they're named after Ja'far al-Sadiq Doctor I do believe we have a caller on the line (laughs) very popular tonight mashallah Salaam Alaikum your name and where you're calling from my name is Abbas and I'm calling from Amsterdam. Salam alaikum Abbas. Your question please to the Sayyid. Uh, uh, yes sir. Go ahead please, go ahead. Okay. Uh, my question is that uh, I have two questions actually. Uh, the first one is that uh, I want to know if there's a, a link or any platform that we can be directing our questions regularly to uh, okay. with Sayyid. Okay. And the second question is that if uh, 
we can have some references from uh, say Buhari or say Muslim with regard to Maulid Nabi. Okay. Uh, well, if we can also make a comparison with uh, what the Sunni, our Sunni brothers will say did us, uh, for example, uh, if we are going to co uh, compare it with Salat al-Tarawih or any of those things that they practice and, and, and forbid us, Inshallah. Thank, Thank you for your question. Thank you. In terms of direct questions, they can send direct questions the to Sayyid Omar Naqshawani on Facebook. Mm -hmm. um, or you can send uh, direct questions to here on Imam Hussein TV3. The number should be at the bottom there. The number there yeah. at the bottom. In terms of those who argue that the birth of, and, or the celebration of the birth, the yes. Mawlid, is a bid'ah. We discussed this on our show last night and you can refer to the show last night. And I have a lecture mm -hmm. on YouTube about celebrating the birth of the Holy Prophet where I provide references from the Quran, from the world of Hadith. Not only about the concept of certain days being days of blessings, not only about prophets who said, peace be upon me the day I was born. born yes. Not only about God mentioning how certain people, peace be upon them the day when they, they were, were born. born. Not only how the Ahlul Bayt السلام, had the greatest of joys when remembering the days of births oh, of their yes. own um, beloved ones, but also the opinions of many of the ulama. This is not a, a Sunni Shia issue, the idea of the celebrating the Mawlid or the Bid'ah. This is all Salafi propaganda mm -hmm. that is spread everywhere. Otherwise, in the Sunni and the Shia world, the Mawlid is a day in which people remember the greatest blessings ever sent to mankind. But they remember it by exchanging amongst them smiles. Smile is a form of charity. Definitely. Knowledge. Knowledge is a form of charity and knowledge is an obligation. And following the sunnah and that's an obligation as well. It's not bid'ah therefore when you do those three. Hassan, doctor. We have another caller on sure, the line, believe it or not. Please, your name and where you're calling from. Uh, hello, brother. My name is Mohammed Bakr and I come from Sweden, Malmö. Salaam alaikum, Mohammed Bakr. Your question, please, for the Sayyid. Uh, first of all, Salaam Alaikum Sayyidna and may God bless you for every knowledge that you are spreading and uh, Thank you. My Alaikum question is, uh, is what is the relationship between a uh, base philosophy and the Greek philosophers like okay. Aristotle, Socrates or Plato? Thank you very is much. Is there like a clarity or Okay, no problem. We'll discuss that with the Sayyid. Sayyid, falsifer from the Ahlul Bayt and falsifer from other uh, schools of uh, philosophy. You know, this uh, this is a discussion that requires its own show entirely. <laughs> Insha'Allah. We'll, you know, we'll to, do summarize, uh, to summarize in just a couple of minutes, looking at Aristotelian or look at Greek philosophy in general um, and comparing it with the teachings of Ahlul Bayt, alayhi salam, requires... You know, its own show. There is the remnants of the philosophy of the Greeks that still can be seen in the seminaries. Um, until today, there are, you know, within the study of Mantak and the seminaries, yes. um, you'll, you'll look at certain principles of Aristotelian logic and the discussions um, looking at, for example, analogy, syllogisms, for example, mm -hmm. inductions, the different processes that are involved. Yes. Um, and the different breakdowns of the way the human being thinks and what are the mistakes we make when mm -hmm. we're thinking. A lot of this they will inherit and are open to uh, admitting are discussed in relation to uh, Aristotelian or Greek philosophy uh, and the literature that we have from there. Then you have, for example, there is an opinion that some may put forth that we have to be careful what we get from the philosophers who are not the Imams of Ahlul Bayt mm -hmm. And until today, in between Qum and Mashhad, for example, you have debates as to the value of philosophy, but where that knowledge of philosophy mm -hmm. comes from. Yes. Do I need to refer to these philosophers when I have the greatest minds of the minds of Ahlul Bayt You find that there is one school which says that you can... You know, wisdom is the lost treasure of the believer. Mm -hmm. For example, you can gain wisdom even from a person who's a hypocrite. For example, you can gain wisdom even from someone who's non-Muslim. And there is that school that says there is nothing wrong. At the end of the day, all of this is for the benefit of human being mm -hmm. and for the growth of the human being. 
Then there are others who say that no, you start to pollute your minds by taking certain principles or uh, reach certain conclusions or take up certain axioms, for example, which may differ with the teachings of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt. Then there is this whole debate and discussion concerning whether these Greek philosophers are seen as messengers of God on the earth. Mm -hmm. Were they people who weren't just philosophers but were rather amongst the 124,000 prophets of God with some believing they were, others completely denying this. So there is definitely an interaction that takes place either until today in the studies in the seminary mm -hmm. or in terms of certain controversial debates that continue between scholars who are pro or anti the usage of Greek philosophy within uh, the Shi'i seminaries. Yep. Ahsant, ahsant. Sayyid, we were discussing about uh, Janat al-Baqi and, and Medina. As Shia, what can we do to help uh, save the Shia heritage in Medina? Because I even believe that there's ruins of the University of Imam Sadiq. There's like bits of rock and stones and things like that. His name is still there. Wow. His name... Anyone who goes this year to Umrah or Hajj, you'll see the names of the 12 Imams mm -hmm. in the mosque of the Prophet in Medina. Wow. Many don't know this. Mm -hmm. The names of the 12, 12 imams. imams in the mosque of the Prophet in Medina. If you look up, yes. if you just take about, I would say, 15 steps back from the back of the grave of the Prophet, 15 steps walk backwards. If you look up, normally they put this big white type of mm -hmm. cover Look up and you'll see the names of the 12 Imams of Ahlul Bayt wow. salam. And Imam al-Sadiq salam's name is there. Mm -hmm. It seems that sadly the Wahhabi movement is adamant and intent on destroying the heritage of the Ahlul Bayt salam. And the heritage of Islam in general. Yes. And you know, those areas and those pieces of heritage related to the Prophet, peace be upon his family, his companions, the Caliphs, the Ahlul Bayt salam. A lot of them have been destroyed, a lot of them have been bulldozed, replaced by hotels. Mm -hmm. Replaced by car parks. I think the likes of, uh, you know, Robert Fisk, amongst others, well-known journalists who have discussed, you know, the heritage of Ahlul Bayt, the heritage of the Prophet, and how it's been destroyed in Medina year upon year, and how the Saudis are adamant mm -hmm. and intent on doing it. I think there is a need for us to try through different methods, whether it's through the United Nations and their programs of preserving heritage, whether it's through diplomatic discussions, to see if there is a way in which um, in the political world, you know, sometimes if you see someone meeting anyone from Saudi Arabia, straight away our people are like, how could you? This is wrong. This is... <laughs> well, sometimes it could be a discussion concerning yes. Baqiya. So we have to find different ways in which we're able to sit on a round table and hopefully discuss these things. But I think they've got their own issues and, you know, there's a few five-star hotels with princes locked up in them at the moment. So I think they've got to deal with those issues for now. Ascent, ascent. Um, if we have time, just for one question from the, the WhatsApp. Um, it's in regards to ta'abut and having symbols of the Ahlul Bayt and touching it and kissing it. Is this shirt? Isn't this a practice of the Hindus? Are we actually allowed to do things like that? And how do we refute people who have the, this sort of ideology? I think there's nothing written in our literature about a tabut, for example, a coffin going around a congregation with people touching it. That's not there in the, in the teachings of the Ahlul Bayt. Yes, the word tabut is mentioned in the Quran as a box which preserved the heritage of the prophets of God. It's mentioned towards the end of chapter 2 of the Holy Quran from verse 2, 4, 5 onwards in relation to the heritage and artifacts of Moses and David's inheritance um, but in terms of the tabu that goes around, normally this is cultural acts which seek to remember the plight of the Prophet Muhammad's family, peace be upon them. And, and you know, if you want to hold that tabu, you can. If you want to stay on the side and just watch it um, go around, you can. You know, there's no obligatory act required and not much that's recommended, in fact, in relation to this. These are just ways in which a person tries to express their love of the Ahlul Bayt, alayhi wa salam. Say the final point for the viewers before we log off. Well, I think, it's, you know, it's great and we ce celebrate with the viewers and congratulate mm -hmm. them on the birth of Imam Salah alayhi salam. And let's pray there'll be a day we sit together and give a lecture in Jannat al-Baqiyah next Inshallah. to his grave. Inshallah. Are we having a show on Monday? Yes, we are. Inshallah. Inshallah.
So that's it for tonight. Thank you very much for joining us and we hope that you are celebrating and enjoying yourselves on this joyous occasion of the birth of Imam Sadiq alayhi salam wherever you are at home or in the mosques. And inshallah, please join us for a new discussion on a new topic on Monday at 9pm with myself and Dr. Sayyid Amar Nakshwani. From us, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh.